The last time I spoke, I talked about this subject. I uh, kind of referred to it as something that's coming. I think it's here now. I've talked in the past about the fact that they've had pilot states. Now it's coming to every state. One of the pilot states is Colorado. If you go to your, your state medical board and take a look around, if you're from this state, you will see that they're actively planning not only maintenance of certification, but also maintenance of licensure. And uh, this, this whole process pretty much originates with the ABIM and the ABMS. I'll use these terms. ABIM, ABIM is the Internal Medicine Board, and ABMS is the mother board, if you would. Um, as again, I, I studied in Germany. I'm a hospital-employed physician probably for the last 15, 20 years. I did have some private practice experience for a while. I don't emulate what you folks are, private practitioners, in, in a non-hospital setting, so I'm a bit different. But the advantage of that is I've, I've understood this whole certification thing as it's been over the past 30 years. I've lived it intensely. My European education shows me that the only place in the world at this point in time that the ABMS has any prerogative is the United States. And we know that healthcare exists in excellent fashion in other nations throughout the world. It is by no means something that is obligate. I'm gonna talk about regulatory capture, but before I do that, I will make a disclosure. Everything I say, from my standpoint, really should have no uh, impact on uh, liability in terms of what you want to accept from me. There is a lot of financial and uh, uh, monetary information in anything that the ABMS presents and the ABIM presents, and I'm going to use their facts to show you what it is exactly we're dealing with. Regulatory capture occurs when special interests, co-op policymakers, or political bodies regulatory agencies in particular, to further their own ends. That is what MOC and MOL is. The Federation of State Medical Boards, the FSMB, is pushing the MOL project to capture physicians. These are the people that have given us the USMLE, the FLEX, the uh, ECFMG tests, to validate educational training across the country because various states felt the need to understand that people coming from foreign countries particularly had some knowledge that was valid in terms of their educational background. In the United States, we have the ACCME, the ACGME, blah, 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 blah. All these agencies monitoring residency training, I don't think there's any need for an FSMB at this point in time, but they believe there is a need, and that need is their own financial security. Now, our first expedition into certification, I think, is our healthcare provider as ACLS. Everybody seems to have had done that at least during residency at some point. I know when I first did it, it was for life, and then it became every two years. If you make something that people will buy, you can make them buy it repeatedly. And as an anesthesiologist, where we've gone from ABC now to CAB with breathing kind of optional, I don't really buy into that. I did my PhD research in resuscitation. There's a lot there that is not coming forth. ACLS has been dumbed down for the guy on the street. And we're physicians, and yet we have to go and certify. Do I, as a quote, board certified anesthesiologist, really need to go every two years and buy this certificate? Yeah, because my hospital says I need to do that. But it does nothing for me except waste six hours on Saturday every time I have to do it and the money associated with it. It's important to recognize that certification is nothing but a promise. In the uh, book To Air is Human from the federal government in 1999, there's a statement there that the board certification is essentially a good housekeeping seal of approval whereby it lacks the one thing that the good housekeeping seal has, and that's a money back guarantee on any products purchased. It's just simply a promise with no backing, and, the, and it's uh, propagated from the American Board of Medical Specialties as higher standards, better care. I tell you, their standards are these guidelines that we talked about, and they use their tests to validate that people most recently certified do better on their tests based on these new guidelines that come out, and it's a fallacy to believe that that's better care. They've even made the statement that every year after leaving medical school, you will become a less competent physician. Wait a minute, what's residency all about? So there's a lot of nonsense in this, and I want to share it with you. You know, Milton Friedman said in 1962, the pressure on the legislature to license an occupation rarely comes from the members of the public. It invariably comes from the occupation itself. These are gilding. Guilds are means of forming societies to keep competition out. These boards are basically anti-competitive in their very nature, and now they are becoming uh, an onus on physicians, a tax, if you would, in order to remain in practice. 
again, the FSMB with their maintenance of licensure program, they are trying in every state in the union to force us to comply to some program that they set up that will entail tests, costs, and time out of your Saturday. Because even as an employed physician, Compliance and all this doesn't come on my daytime job like airplane pilots will get paid to do their simulation or whatever. No, I have to do it on my Saturdays and working 50 plus hours a week with call, etc. This is a viable, this is a very important time in my life to be off work with my family, etc. And I think that's true for you too. We can experience burnout. But they also have a corporate lobbying budget. It was $200,000 in, uh, in 2009. They are a political entity. They can lobby. They're a membership organization which receives not one cent in membership fees upon review of their IRS documentation. The, right now, I'm going to give you the take-home message. If it isn't in your state, it's coming in Ohio. We fought it, we defeated it. It took basically two involved physicians to monitor the state medical board, look for this program, it will be coming, and two people can alarm. And you need to alarm the biggest state organization you can find, even if it means becoming member for the first time, which I didn't just three years ago, specifically to follow this through. And if you have two individuals, whom, and Dr. Chrisman is the other individual that I worked with in Ohio, to monitor the state medical board. We were successful on a number of uh, issues, including mole. We stopped mole. We got the executive director ousted from the state medical board. We've incurred into the state medical board, pushed them back. They're, they tried to impose restrictions upon prescriptions. You don't know what you need to follow the state medical board to stop them from doing. Ohio was pretty vigorous in being opposing to physicians. The fact that we won these battles doesn't mean we can stop. But every state in the union needs to find two involved people to look after the medical board every month, see what they're doing, and get the alarm out. And the Ohio State Medical Association got the alarm out, and with 17 other medical societies in the state, with 15,000 physicians represented, went to the governor and stopped it, but stopped it for now. That was the MOL. Now the ABMS is coming with the with the MOC, and not only MOC, but continuous MOC is the ABIM's new plan. And so you have to now look at it on a national level, and that's why the AAPS is so important, because with Andrew Schleifle, we are fighting this with a lawsuit that may be the ultimate uh, deal. And those of you who are involved need to talk to your colleagues, make them aware of these problems that are currently ongoing. Now is the time to fight because as we see, there's now gonna be money involved, and I'll come to that. These are the original 11 states. Colorado is one of them. Uh, um, Oklahoma and Ohio and Iowa have fought and stopped this with internal uh, efforts of the medical societies. But just because your state is not green on that map, that only means you don't know it's coming, and it's coming. And the recertification requirements are multiple under this concept of continuous maintenance certification. They want you to pay a one-time fee at the beginning of your 10-year cycle, and then they will send you notice when you need to do the rest. And it will be every year you will need to do something, and it will not be cheap. They talk about a $500 a year fee. Well, that's just the fee to them. Then you got to buy your CME. You got to go do this thing, a practice improvement module. You got to pay your employees to gather the data, to do whatever it is they want, and then spend your Saturday doing something else for them at no, at no pay. You know, these weren't the rules when I certified. This is from their website. The ABMS and ABIM believe that a more continuous MOC program is vital to fulfilling their mission, not any, any mission we have, but their mission of improving care in their way, shape, and form. And the fact of the matter is, I'm gonna try and show you that board certification, in my mind, is something that is useful for resident training to have people, instead of doing on-the-job training, do something more to go for a professional level of value to make their, their studies, their residency, something more than simply on-the-job training and to validate for them that their training meant something and so that when people come and look at a residency training program, they can say, what was your board pass rate? Was it good? Was it bad? As an index of quality for a training, but in terms of post residency training, post board certification, it's not useful, it doesn't prove anything, it doesn't make people better. People are better who do the boards because we're all striving individuals. We are better physicians if we take on every task and, uh, and people who may not do that may have less drive. Um, 
the issue, again, is the PQRS MOC trap that is being formulated with the ABMS, went to Congress, lobbied Congress, told them to build into the ACA a clause as a quality index, board certification, and participation in board certification as an index for payment under these laws. And it was initially designed to be a positive payment of 0.5% of your Medicare Medicaid billings to be paid to you. Could you prove you were compliant in the process? The fact of the matter is it's a hidden tax and I'm going to show you why. It's going to be a 2% tax in 2015 to anyone who does not comply completely. And again, compliance, it's all about compliance and compliance has nothing to do with quality care. This slide here shows, shows you the financial impact of the ABMS right now. And again, in 2000, the 10-year cycle of recertification became a reality. That's an important thing to bear in mind because in 2010, everybody was pretty much, uh, who, was, who has come out of residency in the past 10 years, would be forced to be enrolled in MOOC. And I can say from the anesthesia standpoint, in 2013, there was data simulation as a requirement for compliance. So all the residents in anesthesia, about 1,500 a year come out, have to do that. So by 2013, there would have been 4,500 anesthesia residents who would have had to comply with this and would have had to have done the simulation part. But in, in 2012, they only found 500 individuals. And in 2013, there was only 1,400 individuals who had taken this required simulation, indicating to me that there is a very very, very low compliance with this concept in my field and probably very likely in your field as well. But at $374 million a year, that's what board certification paid out in 2011. That is not sneezing money. And that was $10 million in executive salaries to the, CE, to the CEOs of these companies. And if you look at the top at family medicine, family doctors, do they really make $728,000 a year? And, and Dr. Stockman from the, from the Board of Pediatrics in 2009, he earned $1.2 million as the CEO of the American Board of Pediatrics when the American Board of Pediatrics lost $2 million. I mean, what's this all about? And there are the salaries as I've listed them. Pediatrics in 2011 was $933,000. Those, those pediatricians make way too much money. Okay. What about certification? Only 29% 20, uh, of the doctors in the United States have never become board certified. This is data from the, the Ohio State Medical Board. It's, it's a year old now, the numbers may be shifting. I don't know which way they're shifting. I can only say that profits among the American boards seem to have gone down in the last year and a half, two years. But there's a large number of doctors out there that have never certified and are not going to be able to get into the MOC and the FSMB wants to sell them, these doctors, an opportunity to compete and comply with, M with this new PQRS law, and that's what they're looking at for their income. And again, USMLE 1, 2, and 3, now we're gonna have a USMLE number 4 for doctors in practice to finance the FSMB. This is from the ABMS, and if you look down here where that little arrow is, you see that over 375,000 specialists currently participate in ABMS MOOC, but there's 800,000 doctors in the United States. From their own data, less than half in 2010 of all physicians were in this program. Doctors don't believe in certification. It's anything more than just one more thing to add to their CV. Uh, who else is watching us? We have an overlay of thousands and thousands of people monitoring our care, our quality of care, and we've heard in this last lecture just how severe it can still become. And don't kid yourself, these MOC programs, they start off simple, but they keep getting more and more because the ABMS and the boards, they have no oversight. It's 14 guys in a boardroom making the decisions, and they have a chief financial officer financial officer sitting next to them trying to tell them what they need to do to continue to remain profitable. Now, if we have all wondered why healthcare is so expensive in the United States, I wanna offer this slide from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, our federal government, which indicates there's a very flat growth in doctors 
the numbers in the United States, but by Jove, there's a lot of administration going on, and there's the ACA in print, and I think it's taller than anybody in this room. I mean, there's a lot there to read. That's why Pelosi says we have to pass it to, to find out what's in it, because nobody's read it. I don't believe anyone's read it. But the problem with medicine today is not what we do in patient care, it's all these layers upon layers of things that everyone else, I mean, the, the government is set to default again these guys can't even run their business. Why are they telling us doctors how we should be practicing medicine? I don't understand it. These are states that have, these are states that have active fights ongoing in terms of their medical societies opposing legislation. I've been recently invited to go to North Carolina to help fight the uh, oppression there, as we call it, because one of the, the new uh, director of the board of the FSMB is now on the medical board there. In Ohio, the reason Ohio was the primary uh, state was because we had the chief executive officer of our board was a board member of the FSMB, and the, one of the physicians on the board was the chairman of the board, and they had been infiltrating Ohio for a number of years, and they thought that they could railroad us, but two physicians paying close attention, informing colleagues can make the difference in stopping this, and I beseech everyone to go home and talk to your colleagues and make this happen in the biggest medical society you can find in your state if you have to join to make it happen. So uh, Larry Huntoon pushed in his state in New York for resolutions in his county, and when you go up against in your county these people, you have to realize there are academics who have personal interests in this in my own institution without mentioning names further. I am also subject, I cannot use the name of my institution in this speech because it should not come out. We've heard it in the, pre, in the pre, pre, prelude. But at any rate, in his society, he found great opposition at the, at the, at the county level, but once you step out and start talking to practitioners at large, the opposition is overwhelming. And, and this, these are the resolutions that passed in New York. The AMA now in, the, in Chicago in 2013, the various states have brought this up to the AMA. Now the AMA is not the organization it was 40 years ago. I hope to see the AAPS become that organization for America. But at any rate, it is, It is the agency that is certified in the minds of the bureaucrats as being those leading physician, and even they are taking notice. In Chicago, they looked at the MOC, the MOL issues, and they have taken notice. There is great opposition at the national level because there are so many academics there, but we need every state to come forward and argue this debate because it is a real issue. So do it at the state level. I'm gonna go quicker here because of time and pursue legislative activity. Just because you've got it done in your own uh, medical society, the whole point is to take it to the legislator to see laws passed that prohibit coupling of maintenance of licensure to your license or maintenance of certification to any form of licensure, hospital participation, insurance payments of any kind. And I think because ABMS went to the government and, and CMS to pay for MOC under the PQRS laws that I think we will have a national uh, uh, instance with Andrew Shafley in the defense through the lawsuit. Now, don't kid yourself. This will grow and grow and grow. This is a recently awarded uh, American Board of Dermatology uh, diploma, and you have to realize that it's valid through December contingent contingent upon participation in and completion of maintenance of certification. Board certification is now a mere enrollment requirement to get into MOC and pay your money and participate. That is all, it has been degraded from something of significance to that. And this just came, came down from the American Board of OBGYN, which, which emphasized the detail and degree that these boards seem to think that they can dictate to us as physicians what we should be doing in our practice. For OBGYNs who did not limit a minimum of 75% of their practice to the areas of medicine listed in the above named bulletins shall not be eligible to become certified in or to maintain their certification by the ABOG. So if you, don't, if you start treating men, you may not be able to call yourself board certified. And if you can't call yourself board certified, well, you're not going to be able to get MOC or, the, or avoid the penalty of the PQRS laws which, which really need to be repealed. So the certification may be revoked. I hope these will all be on the internet for you to review. 
The care of male, male patients is prohibited except in the following circumstances. So if, you know, if you're delivering a baby and the father goes down and you're an OBGYN, don't go over and try and help them out. You might jeopardize your board certification. Now, what is certification? It's a promise without any sort of uh, financial backing or delivery. And how is it different from, the, you all saw this, you read the magazine on the flight in, the top doctors in America. I mean, we're all top doctors. So this guy paid a little more, got his picture in a, in, in a, in a, in a journal on the airplane, and so now people are gonna run to him, and I, you know, I don't know that, but it's, it's certification is meaningless. It's something bean counters want, the only time certification really matters is when you're going for that next job because it will be required or something you need to list, and if it's not there, it seems to be an issue. But as board certification becomes a recurrent whatever, much like ACLS, most hospitals don't require it, but because I work at a heart hospital, they seem to want it. And you will be em 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 implored to do this by your employers. And I, as an employed physician, like to point out that you know, eh, skin off my nose, it costs me my Saturdays, but my hospital's paying for it. And if the ABMS can, and many, many people are becoming hospital employees, this will become a tax, not on the doctors, but on the hospitals that employ them. And ultimately, it's a tax on every tax paying American and patient in America, because you gotta pay for the whole cost of medical care. And if we put this senseless, needless, wasted cost into medicine, it's dollars out the window for no value whatsoever. Now, you know, I have my, my degree on the left from my German university, the State Medical Board of Ohio, I have to have that license to practice. But this stuff down here, I did recertify in 2005, and I'm gonna blow those up a little bit. When I first got my board certification, I was a licensed graduate of medicine having complied with all the requirements of this board and qualified to serve as a consultant in anesthesiology without time limit. But now, I'm awarded maintenance of certification, and that's it, and it'll expire whenever it expires. This is a time-limited, meaningless document to me. So CMS is starting to get on this. They're trying to couple money, money and payments to it. We need to stop it now, and now is the time, because people are, going, are noticing the fact that this is gonna cost them. Remember how upset everyone was when they heard 2% sequester? Well, the MOCPQRS is gonna be 2% penalty if you're not enrolled, and then you're gonna be paying probably $5,000 each year to the ABMS or their affiliate just to have the privilege of not being taxed or punished by this PQRS law. And these are the numbers. 2013 is the index year. The uh, American Board of Anesthesiology, 2% uh, will be in 20, 2016 will be the payment the penalty payment, 2015, 1.5, and you see the graduation. You still get a positive payment in 2014 if you sign up and enroll. The American Board of Anesthesiology sent this notice out to us in 2010, and it states, the ABA, the American Board of Anesthesiologists, does not believe that the additional requirements for the MOC bonus will have sufficient impact on patient care, nor will the reimbursement bonus justify the additional time and resource burden on its diplomats. My own board said, what the heck is this, okay? But they have changed their mind because of the, the laws and the costs. If they didn't become providers for PQRS, none of us would be able to avoid the tax because you have to become a provider as a board in order for the members of your board to avoid the tax. And so this year, just several weeks ago, they sent out the notice that they have become providers so that we will be protected against the penalties without ever having gotten any benefit payments, which was the way it was started up. So this basically boils down to extortion in my mind. You know, make them an offer you can't refuse. You can refuse to do this. And I personally hope and think that with everything that I've seen and heard here at this meeting today, it's very likely that physicians are just gonna say, take your CMS, Medicaid, Medicare card and stick it in your ear, I'm going cash. And you can, or have your patients go to the government and get reimbursed. This is my fee and it's a just fee and this is one of the few professions that I'm aware of that the government can set up a monopoly control on payments, which is supposed to be illegal under the various laws of the land, but nonetheless, it happens. It's, it's extortion, it's racketeering. 100 years ago, we didn't need a license. In the 60s, the Medicare and Medicaid come, on law, come online. 2000, board certification became a cycle. I'm gonna move fast. Lifelong learning or testing. These are tests. I've never learned anything from or anything for any of these board tests. 
I've always been an avid reader. I love what I do. I learn everything I can. I learn at every opportunity. And I go and I take the test. And who figures? I actually pass them, you know? We pass them because we are good. They don't make us good. We pass them because we are good. And the guidelines, we heard this talk about guidelines. Go read the August Journal of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. There's an article in there. They studied a year of the New England Journal of Medicine articles, and they found 138 standard practices which were nonsense, which were rejected upon review in the New England Journal of Medicine, of which we're all familiar. And in 2011, in England, the NICE, the, the governmental organization there, looked and found 800 standard medical practices which should not be given credence. That's the reversal in medicine that they're talking about. As far as maintenance of certification goes, this paper identified it reviewed the, the, the chief people in the various ABIM organizations, and they looked at all the leaders, and they found that only 9% uh, of them actually recertified in, in uh, general medicine when they had grandfather status. So they don't believe in this stuff. They do it to stay uh, either on board or to meet some other one's uh, demands. Uh, it is not something that's inherently a, a, a native belief among the, um, whether it's in their subspecialty or, or in their general uh, thing. I reviewed my members in anesthesiology on the, this is our journal with all the names, and I found that only two individuals were certified in 2014 uh, in advance of the, uh, in, and they were certified in January of 2014 back in October. So you can certify and get it certified in advance. What, what's that all about? And only one primary certification after 2000 happened. Most of these people are lifelong grandfathers. Most of them did not recertify in 2000 when they should have because of the issues involved, but at some later date. And, um, many, and none of the foreign names on there who are respected people in my field are certified by the ABMS or anybody, which again brings back my international background that it's only the United States that has this. And why is it? Well, we're a for-profit uh, place. This is a picture of Dr. Cassell. She is the, the, the president of the ABMS, and she recertified in, in, in 1998 and in 2005. She walked the walk, so to speak. But the funny thing is, that, that she only did it in geriatric medicine and not in internal medicine, although when she's been on the task force regarding this topic, the mandates in the ABIM were that if you wanted to be certified in geriatrics to make it valid, you had to be certified in internal medicine. Well, the leaders don't believe their own words. And this is Dr. Chowdhury, the, the chairman of the FSMB, uh, president, CEO. He, uh, his certification status, which was about five months ago, was he's not certified. He certified uh, through 2006 and never recertified with the ABM, ABIM. This is from the ABM uh, website. Uh, he may have recertified in the DO uh, certification because he is a DO, but the, but the reality is for the DOs, this OCC, this DOMOC program, only started last year. So from 2006, on through, he was never recertified in any way, shape, or form. And these are the chairman, and this is the really interesting statement. At the, at the Ohio State Medical Association, we have an online board where members can post information for general consumption. And if you join a medical society and can get a blog on the front page of that medical society that goes to all the members, that is probably the singular most important thing to disseminate facts and knowledge because people will respond to you and you will grow your network. Information, knowledge is power. And, Dr. T and this is a statement made by Lance Talmadge who was the uh, executive board member of the FSMB and one of the guys on our state medical board who we fought heartily with. Uh, I personally had my altercations with him. Dr. Chaudhry is in fact recertified by the Board of Osteopathic Internal Medicine. And the FSMB has developed a policy for non-clinically active physicians to allow them to document appropriate continuing professional development as an alternative. Well, he's one of their guys, so they're going to make a special program for him to make sure that he doesn't have any problems. So, you know, it's, this is gilding at its best, inside groups, making systems that work for them, and by the way, they'll make ourselves a lot of money, you know, $1.2 million for a year's work is not something to sneer at. Dr. Lo uh, Lois Margaret Nora is our newest director of the ABMS. She certified first in 1987 
never in between. I, I pulled this down in uh, January of this year, and I've in, in the meantime been informed that in April she finally recertified. Boy, that really documents conviction in the importance of recertification when you can go for decades without it and only recertify when you've taken the head job at the board because they want you to have it. You know, is certification important or not? I uh, went to the ASA Closed Claims Project and I asked them to look between 1990 and 1999 and tell me if board certified doctors had more malpractice or less malpractice than non-board certified doctors. And they looked at the data and, they, and the instances were exactly the same because they only gave me one set of numbers. The only number that became uh, different was the, um, on the next slide here, that board certified physicians in the malpractice they paid an uh, average of 187,000, while non-board certified physicians only paid 150,000. So although the incidence and the severity of, of complications were the same in both groups, and the numbers of occurrences were relative to the, uh, this 29% non-certified uh, uh, rate in America, the only difference was if you were board certified, you got to pay higher uh, awards because you're supposed to know more, right? So it's more of a liability than an advantage. And this has been documented through this article uh, where they looked over 10 years of Florida and, Alab and six years of Alabama data looking at whether board certification played a role in terms of care in the outpatient setting. This was a period in time, of course, when there was a lot of uh, controversy over uh, complications occurring in, in um, uh, outpatient setting regarding liposuction, things like that. And the, the take home message is there is an exceedingly low complication rate in both. Requiring physician board certification and physician hospital privilege does not seem to increase safety of patients undergoing surgical procedures in the office setting. And the complications per physician were 0.56% across the board in both states, which again supports my contention that there is no difference between these two. Um, there was no pattern of more adverse events in those who were not board certified. Board certification on overall safety of patients undergoing surgical procedures in the office setting doesn't make a difference. The overwhelming majority of physicians uh, reporting adverse events were board certified, but then there are more board certified physicians. So what about recertification? This is from the Annals of Internal Medicine, and this is where the disclaimer about uh, corporate influence comes into play, because the ABMS, they, they pay people, they take their executive editors, they create these papers, they get them published, because by the way, all these guys are, are chief executive editors on most of their specialty uh, journals, so it's very easy for them to get their stuff published. If you try to write something against MOC or MOL, you will have a great deal of difficulty because they'll be there to filter that out against you. But the bottom line was, there's the overview on the American Board of Internal Medicine recertification. They kept trying to introduce it, introduce it, introduce it. And when they tried to do that in 74, the first year they got 3,000 people to sign up, then 2,000, then 1,000. Nobody wanted this. It was very clear to them. And uh, it was evident that the only way to make this happen was to force it upon physician. And uh, of course, they recommended charging low fees. That's just to get you in the door. The fees continue to expand. So the answer is just to force everyone into high cost compliance. Now, is there scientific evidence for board certification? And this again is from the ABMS, ABIM. The two leaders were president and uh, executive vice president on the American Board of Medical Specialties as main authors on this paper. And they said few published studies, only 5%, used research methods appropriate for the research question. And among the screen studies, more than half support an association. So they will always turn it. You got 5% of all the studies, and they're all bad. And these 5% of the studies are all retrospective studies. It's not science. It's showing association. And I always say, the sun always comes up and the sun always goes down. They don't cause each other. It's an association and it always happens, but it's not proof that the sun will rise or fall because the world just might end tomorrow. And with Obamacare, that seems more probable. <laughs> it, the result of that study I was referring to, they looked at over 1,200 papers, selected 237, was re reduced to uh, 56 patient, papers to which they only found 13 to include into their, quote, meta-analysis, whereby they, they clearly stated this was not a meta-analysis because there wasn't any information there to document an, uh, the, the statistical probabilities needed for a meta-analysis. And if you go to the ABMS website, they will list 
uh, a, a whole bunch of, of documents that supposedly support this, but this is what this is. It's not science, it's conjecture, but they list these things there. So when people go to their website and see the American Journal of this or JAM or whatever, it sounds like something that's valid. And as we learned over here from Dr. Harris, you really need to examine the nature of these things to give them the value they're worth. And the kicker, the take home kicker, there was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine that came out and looked at maintenance of certification for, as to its value or not that prompted the ABMS to come out even more vigorously with myths and facts stated on their website. But they also include this statement, which I think is very important. Fact, ABMS recognizes that regardless of the profession, whether it's healthcare, law enforcement, education, or accounting, there is no certification that guarantees performance or positive outcomes, and that's their own words. Now, if you're gonna get ready to sign up for the, for the American Board of whatever, I don't like to pick on any one, so I pulled this from the pathologist. Everything in yellow are things that are problematic for you as an American. I hereby release, discharge, covenant not to sue and hold harmless the ABP, its trustees, officers, members, examiners, representatives, all these guys. I understand that as evidence either by observation or by statistical analysis, incorrect answers of one or more participants in the examination, blah, 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 blah. You are signing off your life. You're giving a pound of flesh. You're holding them completely free of any liability for anything that they would care to say or do about you in terms of your board certification before you even get to take the test. If you're gonna join, I mean, I would never sign, you wanna buy a car with all this in it? Good luck, you might get off the parking lot. So the testimonial to cost is there. Um, this is from an email I received from a colleague. On Sunday, I spent five hours on the computer completing a course to be accepted as my part four module for maintaining my board certification in family medicine. The course was free. Today I found out that in order for the course to be credited to my MOOC, I have to pay the American Board of Family Medicine $625. How do they justify this? I ask, how do they justify this? It's about the money, honey. So at any rate, I've, I've said all that. Feel free to contact me. Go to www.changeboardresearch.com. Say no to MOOC. Again, my, my German background without trying to slander anyone, do not become one of the Jews marching to the gas chamber by following and doing this stuff because you will only support that machine if you do so. Thank you.